This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an Today's extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever mermaids. is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Hail and well met readers and reviewers. Today's guest is Rose Strickman. Rose Strickman is a speculative fiction writer and reading addict living in Seattle, Washington. She was published in Sword and Sorceress 32, the anthology, uh, alongside Mercedes Lackey, and is the author of the Drowned World series on Amazon. Post apocalyptic mermaids. If you're interested in post apocalyptic, uh, post -apocalyptic mermaids, uh, check out the Drowned World series on Amazon. So, uh, Rose, welcome. Glad to have you here today. How's Hello, it going? Benjamin. It's fine. Thank you. <laughs> good, good. Well, folks who can see us can see these amazing costumes that we put on for the show, but the folks who are listening on the podcast have no idea what we're wearing, so we have to tell them. So what is it you chose to wear for our show today? Well, I'm in full Victorian regalia. I have a little feathered hat and a sexy, sexy black dress on, tall boots. Excellent. And, you know, I wanted to match, and so I went with that gray suit and the waistcoat and top hat and the blue spectacles that Gary Oldman wears in the 1992 adaptation of Dracula. I always thought he looked so cool in that. Uh, I do not look as cool as, uh, as as Gary Oldman as Dracula, but people can use their imaginations. But the, the top hat's a good look. Uh, so folks, as you're listening, you know, imagine uh, the, 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 you know, the uh, a couple of very, very posh Victorians uh, uh, today. So Rose, I've been so excited to have you on this is a show about procrastination. Uh, when you're not procrastinating, though, what have you been working on lately? Well, um, I'm working on short stories still for publication, still submitting. And my major major big project right now is a short novel based off um, very, very loosely off the Iliad. Cool. It is set, yeah, it is set in a world inhabited solely by immortal elves who... Who can talk to who can talk to trees because they're elves, and and it's been very interesting writing this world with real world building because you don't often find um, fantasy settings with just elves. Yeah, it's like usually it's a variety of different creatures, so it's interesting see trying to like like um world build this there's world build this place with just with just elves and what their society looks like, and you know asking the question does any do any of them actually live forever? Right, because you know, something gets every one of them in the end. And then if you do live for a long time, you're bound to face, it's like asking questions like, you're bound to face brutality and violence at some point. And so that's kind of what's happened to our protagonist here. Like I say, based very, very loosely off the Iliad. So yeah, yeah. get ready for, oh, that get ready for some good Yeah. I, yeah. I, remember I read a, a science fiction novella uh, when I was in high school and I cannot speak to the quality. I was very young when I read it, but I, I really admired it. It was called Outnumbering the Dead. And it was just exploring that idea of if we become immortal, how does that change society? How does that change yeah. a culture? And one of the things that stuck out at me is uh, at one point, the protagonist, who's one of the few people upon whom the uh, the, the the treatment doesn't work. And so he mm -hmm. is aging and everyone around him is, is immortal. And uh, he's talking to someone and he's talking about reading the Iliad and the Odyssey. And the person says, I'll get around to them, but I'm going to wait until I can read them in Greek. There's no wow. incentive to read them now because you're going to live forever. So just wait. And, you know, and so that's one of the ways that it kind of changes people uh, in, in, in this writer's wow. uh, conception is why would you bother to read a translation? Just wait till you can read it in the original. I thought that was really interesting, you know, thinking through how immortality would change people because having a time limit does, you know, provide a nice incentive to get some things done. <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting, you know, just assuming that eventually you will learn to learn to read Greek. Wow. Right, right. I mean, at some point you would have time, you know, and uh, yeah. so I've been playing with that myself with uh, my series with vampires. Like, how would it change you to be immortal? So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think that's a really interesting idea. How to 
characters wrestle with mortality when it may not happen, but you are going to live a very long time or face violence or something like that. I think that's a fascinating idea. Uh, and yeah. what aspects of the Iliad are you plugging in there? How does that play into it? Well, like I say, um, all right, I first met my protagonist when I wrote a short story about her death. Um, she lives to be the oldest woman in the world at age, age 7,000. And I was writing about her son going to her funeral. And um, her funeral is this big state affair because she was she was famous. She was important. It was rare for elves to live this long. And um, he was thinking, not naturally thinking about his parents, thinking about her and about his, about his father and how they met. And it turned out they had a rather violent beginning. It turned out her, his father had carried her off in a war. And he was thinking, you know, I wonder how they made it work, you know? Yeah. They were together a long time, but they had such a brutal beginning. But his mother had understood that eventually you will face violence and brutality if you live long enough. It doesn't matter who you are. And um, it was that was part of how she lived so long is that she was, that she had this, she had this comics, this calmness and this acceptance of things that she could, that she didn't hold on to hatred. Yeah. And um, I, I was exploring the world while I was writing it. I mean, it made, so I was very interested to discover this about my characters and wanted to explore it some more. Yeah. And it occurred to me that this is very close to um, the Iliad, especially the relationship that's always intrigued me about the Iliad, namely the relationship between Achilles and his war prize, Briseis. Yeah. Two, two pretty complicated people in an awkward situation and a, a sort of unhealthy but sort of fascinating relationship. And so I I started exploring that, and like with their my protagonist and and um, her captor in the war camp that's like trying laying siege to her city, and how that's cool. and how um how their relationship commenced and developed, you know extreme you know he's not a bad person, but he did a brutal thing, yeah, and she understands the brutality. But she can't help. She can't help but be attached to him in this weird, yeah. This weird that way. Is, and, um, that's really interesting. Yeah, and how he they finally do destroy the city. You know, much like Troy, um, using using trickery, and how I I'm afraid to spoil it too much. Yeah, don't spoil. But that's that does sound fascinating, and I think that yeah. idea of that relationship how do we explore that relationship kind of sensitively and also acknowledge this is deeply messed up i'm, I'm reminded uh, ursula k Le Guin, I'm trying to think i'm looking here on my shelf for the the title but in one of her ya books so this was a you know it was unusual for ursula k Le Guin to write ya at all but she wrote a mm -hmm. ya trilogy of course it's excellent she was amazingly talented um, of course but in one of the books the character discovers over the course of the book that she herself is a product of rape, that this group oh, of yeah. people invaded the town and that's why she's not accepted among everybody else's. She's mixed uh, and they can just look yeah, at Yeah, I read that one. Yeah. yeah, and that's a complicated and challenging idea for young people to read, you know? And then she does yeah. a really tactful job of kind of, you know, she's not describing the, 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 the scene itself of this, protagonist's conception but mm -hmm. you know it's inescapable like we know there was this you know violence uh in in you know and and so it's it's really well done uh, but yeah i can imagine that writing challenge for you of how do you navigate this story and present these characters as you know complex people uh and, and in a situation that's really challenging i think that's a really cool idea yeah thanks and like it's very heavily influenced by their society because you know this is this is normal for for warfare among these elves this is a normal a normal like basically war tactic like it was in the iliad and i mean when she actually gets pregnant which she does in the story you know getting pregnant's rare among elves this mm -hmm. is a high honor and also you know so you know she doesn't she doesn't even think of like she doesn't even think that she doesn't want the kid because this is this is super super special yeah. among her among her people and you know as soon as she gets pregnant she stops being a war prize because because you know she's pregnant she's gonna be a mother that kind of thing yeah so it's like it was very interesting exploring their the society and like i really love that kind of 
like applying logic to a fantastical situation. Like how would this actually change things? Or what, could, what would society look like if everyone was an immortal elf who could talk to trees? And, and you know, that this was what we think of as magic is actually normal. Right. And, and if you, you had people who were like 10,000 years old and one of the characters is 10,000 years old. <laughs> but I, the I oldest woman I, in the I, world, I, yeah. I, I'm glad. I mean, I think that's a really smart insight that elves would not have children frequently. Because if yeah. you are immortal and you have 20 children, then they are all immortal. You're going to have a massive population problem. And yes. so, you know, one of the ways that immortality would necessarily change a society is, you know, child childbearing and child rearing would be unusual. Yeah, that, yeah. That, and then and then how does that manifest socially? That's that's really interesting. Yeah. So when you're not working on this project, uh, what has been pulling you away in terms of pop culture? What's been distracting you lately? Hmm. Well, Netflix, of course. Good old Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What have you been watching on Netflix? What's been grabbing you? Well, there's Scott Pilgrim. I've been watching the anime of Scott Pilgrim. That's I love Scott Pilgrim. And just sort of, I have this bad habit of starting series and not finishing them. I've also been, I started um, Warrior, and I'm not sure if I'm going to finish it. Yeah, what do you think of the uh, anime of Scott Pilgrim? I have not checked it out. I, I saw the film. Oh, I like it. But is it well done? It okay, is very I'll, well done. I'll add that I like, to I love the way they kept, pile. Yeah, I love the way they kept the surrealism and magical realism of the original, but Ramona Flowers plays a much um, more active role. Mm, good. Yeah. Because they're they, so they recognize because there was a lot of criticism that it was you know the the the, the, the yeah. manic pixie dream girl kind of uh, phenomena. So I'm glad. Yeah. So yeah, she plays a much more she plays a much more active role. Um, they change the story a lot, but in good ways. I feel. Yeah. It's still recognizably Scott Pilgrim, but just like sort of the zaniness, but also, I felt like they made some really good innovations. Yeah. Okay, I'll check that one out. Uh, yeah. What else has been pulling you away from your work? Hmm. Well, playing two dots on my phone. I do that a lot. <laughs> I have that one as well. Yes. And it is, uh, It that one's a great one for like, uh, you know, you're stuck waiting for an airplane or, you know, and, and it's, you know, you're stuck at the DMV waiting for your number to be called. I really enjoy uh, two dots. That's a fun one. So folks, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm hesitant to recommend a time suck, but that is a fun time suck. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm, I'm at a uh, level 208 now. Oh yeah. gosh. You're further than I am, but uh, yeah, it's yeah. a kick. Uh, yeah. It's and, addictive. And then what else have you been reading lately? Hmm. Well, right now I'm in the middle of the marriage portrait. I don't know by this Ma one. Who's that by? By Maggie O'Farrell. I think it was published last year or the year before. Anyway, it's quite good. It's um, it's historical fiction. It is based off um, a poem, My Last Duchess. Oh, yeah, I know the poem. Yeah, it's based off My Last Duchess and based off a real historical figure. Um, Lucrezia, Lucrezia um, Medici, who married... Um, Duke Alfonso, oh golly, I you think I'd remember his name. Yeah, yeah. She married a, she married a duke, um, and he later murdered her in real life. And this is like, um, this is historical fiction, like examining the examining this this murder and what might have actually happened. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. The the, yeah. the Medici intrigue is is really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you know that that that's. Yeah, I, I could I could get into that one. It's you know it's it's succession, uh, you know, uh, before succession. Um, yeah. I'm so, also just I also just finished The Prisoner's Throne by Holly Black. I read it I read it in less than twenty four hours. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's that one about? I've not read that one either. Um, it is part of Holly Black's The Folk of the Air series. I'm a big fan of YA fantasy. Yeah. And um. Folk of the Air is not for everybody. It's a bit brutal, and com and you and you and you think my family dynamics are complicated? <laughs> yeah, this one takes it to a whole new level. Extremely complicated. But yes, this is the latest book in that series, and it was quite good. I really enjoyed it. And yeah. like I say, finished it in less than twenty four hours. Yeah, yep. I, I just finished the uh, Giddy in the Ninth. Uh... What are the the what are the, Gideon the Ninth, Harrow the Ninth, Nora the Ninth uh, novels mm. by uh, Tasman Muir, and same thing. I just 
tore through them uh and yeah, yeah they're, they're incredibly brutal but they're really fun um so yeah, yeah I, will, I will check that one out so what about in the news what's been pulling you away from your work and you know when the world is grabbing our attention oh, i try not to watch the news um uh politics sadly um yeah um but some some more positive things um i really enjoy archaeology articles I love when I see an archaeology article or a paleontology article. Yeah. Those are always fun. Anything uh, recently grab your attention, archaeology-wise? Well, I was reading an article. I like I like ancient Greek. I like ancient Greek mythology and history, as you might have been able to tell. I'm interested in that. And I was reading about um, on Mykonae, I think it was Mykonae. Uh, apparently, first cousin marriages were extremely common among the lower orders. It was all about like normal, ordinary people, which is kind of kind of cool, which is unusual and kind of cool. Right. And they were, were speculating that first cousin marriages were extremely common for um, reasons of property preservation. Ah. Yeah. So that was um. <laughs> keep the wealth in the family, literally. Yeah. Keep the keep the land in the in the family, yeah. even more importantly. And I was interested. In, they 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 were examining examining a family. That consisted of two adult brothers um, who were married to um, their cousins, basically. And they fit, I speculate, and there was a child too. And they speculate that the older sister brought the child with her into the marriage, which makes you wonder, you know, yeah. what's this particularly common in society, you know, that right. woman already had a child when she married him. When you think about it, let's hope so. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, th so that was pretty fascinating. Yeah, do you know what roughly what time period that was uh, in, in Greek history? I'm trying to think. It was it was definitely back before the Athenian period. Okay. Um. Yeah. Because I know during the Athenian period, the the death rate for men in their 20s in war was almost 50 percent and so yeah. probably it was very common uh, for a spouse to enter into a marriage with a child because yeah. You know, the, the you know the men were dying at really really high rates in in war. Of course, women were dying at equally high rates in childbirth. So, like, yeah, uh, I don't know. That, I'm yeah, glad I didn't live back then. I'm really glad I didn't live back then, frankly. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm. I always tell students about uh, um, uh, Octavia Butler uh, was so fed up being asked at at science fiction conventions about time travel stories and what era would you like to have lived in what era would you like to have lived in and here is this you know six foot two beautiful black woman going are, are you kidding there is no time in history i would like to go back to and that's no. what motivated her to write um oh what's the novel where the character keeps being drawn back into the antebellum south to kind of illustrate there was a good time for a you know a, a woman of color in in American history or really any time in history to go back to. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, it's not kin kindred. Was it kindred? Yes, might have been. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it's just it's it is excellent. Uh, so yeah, uh, but that that is what motivated her. You know, when would you want to go back to? There is no time in the past that would be better for you know anybody except his hat white you know <laughs> white guys like. There was all these guys at these conferences going, I would be a knight in shining armor if I were in England. No. Like, you know. Uh, no, you wouldn't actually, but yeah. yeah no, you wouldn't. <laughs> um, so uh, what about hobbies? Any kind of hobby thing that's pulling you away from your work lately? Well, embroidery. I, I embroidered this jacket that I'm wearing. Oh, how cool. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. And um, so how did you get into that? Well, um, so when I was a teenager... I'm not sure when I started doing it. I just found some embroidery floss that used to belong to my sister and just started stitching with it. Sort of taught myself. So you've been doing this for years. Yeah. I've kind of um, fallen behind lately. But yes, I am I embroider as a hobby. Definitely not commercially. Yeah. But that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's a good to have another creative outlet. I find that, you know, for writers, being able to step away from the work and still do something creative to kind of balance is really cool. So yeah. that's, that's great. And what else? What else has been pulling you away from your work? Well, hmm. In terms of hobbies, reading. Yeah. Reading's a big one. Reading's a very big one. Like I say, read The Prisoner's Throne in less than 24 hours. Didn't yeah. do much writing. 
but I mean, you know, reading is interesting because reading is simultaneously pulling us away from our work and it is the work, right? It's a part yeah. of the job. Uh, if, 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 you know, writers are, are listening, you know, the, the show is focused on readers, but for the writers out there who are listening to the show, you have to read. <laughs> if, otherwise, we're, you know, we're, we're not engaging in, in the industry. So it is important yeah. to be uh, participating in that way as well. Uh, but but I agree, it can also be a mechanism to go, I need a break from this project and here's this great book, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> anything else that uh, takes you away from uh, from from your writing? Well, there's Netflix, of course, again. And, um, yeah. and um, sometimes browse, browsing fan fiction. I, I like fan fiction, too. And do you have Again, any that... particular go-tos in fanfic for you that like my partner is for her, it's Pride and Prejudice fanfic. And she's like, some of it's terrible and some of it's wonderful, but she loves her fanfic. Do you have a kind of go-to for fanfic? Um, The Folk of the Air, again, like I say, love the series, but also um have problems with it. So it's kind of interesting reading, reading um fanfic about it that like addresses these issues. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that, and I, you know, and I am a, a firm believer that there, you know, no, no shade to fanfic fans. All Shakespeare ever wrote was fanfic, with exactly. the possible exception of the Merry Wives of Windsor. Everything else is fanfic. There is nothing wrong with fanfic, whether you're a writer or a reader. Uh, fanfic is a legitimate art form, uh, and it's and it's really cool. I shouldn't even say art form. It it, it fanfic is literature, uh, and, well, yeah, uh, and some great. of it's wonderful. Some of it is very wonderful. I there's some Harry Potter fanfic that I just love. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like yeah, you said, you can fix errors really good, too. Yeah. yeah, you can, you know, oh, go, oh, okay, this is deeply problematic. We can correct that. Uh, yeah. What would you like if it weren't in that way? Yeah. And so, people are writing from a position of like real passion here. And that can, that can like make some wonderful stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. one of the things I always like to ask authors to just kind of help readers get to know you is kind of a Rorschach test. So this is not, you know, a... Uh, uh, about Dungeons and Dragons specifically. It's just a mechanism to to get to know you a little bit. But if you were a character in that fantasy world of, you know, Wizards of the Coast creation, what would be your race and class if you were in Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, man. I'm not really into Dungeons and Dragons so much, but maybe I'd be an elf, an elf bard. That'd be fun. Yeah. And so this is why I ask. I, I, I love that answer. What do you think that reveals about you as a person? Why an elf bar? Hmm. Well, um, I guess I'm not a very nitty gritty kind of person. I want a bit of grace mm. and glamour. And um, I'm not very violent either. I don't want to be swinging a sword or getting beaten up. I want to play my harp and charm my enemies and leaving me alone. While I quest on, and yeah, yeah, and I and I've I love music, but I have absolutely no talent whatsoever for it. So it's sort of a daydream of mine, you know, being just being musically gifted and being able to play music and sing. <laughs> yes, oh, that's wonderful. So you know, I always ask if you were this character and you're in that Dungeons and Dragons world and you were ambushed by three level one, you know, not particularly dangerous goblins in the woods, what would be your response? Well, my gut response is run like a rabbit. But um, uh, since I'm an elf bard and I have magic powers in a, in a harp and extreme skill, I can take out my harp and play them into, play them to sleep or play them into a better mood. Yes. So we all pass the, yeah, we all pass the evening, you know, exchanging anecdotes. And they give me instruction. We exchange, you know, advice and instructions for, you know, Whatever we're trying to do next and, and part on good terms. Uh, yeah. I love it. It does not have to be pull out a sword or a club. Uh, that, that's great. Okay, yeah. well, we're going to go to our ad break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask you what you've been daydreaming about. Special announcement time. Not a Pie Publishing has always been committed to helping authors and readers find one another. Well, the show, which is all about helping readers get to know writers, just hit a milestone. 10,000 views on YouTube. So to celebrate, instead of charging authors to advertise their books on the show, I'm gonna run your ads for free throughout 2024. If you wanna make a 30 to 60 second video about your book, let folks know what it's about and where to find it. And don't forget your name and the title. Uh, I'll run one or two of those in our ad spot each week. Just send an MP4 file to the Dot Pipe email address in the show notes. Let's fix up some readers and authors into reader relationships. 2024, more readers, 
more writers, more books. An Accidental Hero, a mostly true Wombat story by Laura Rediger and Debbie Palin is based on events during the aftermath of the Australian bushfires in 2020. Rescuers discovered animals sheltering in wombat burrows. Wombats were praised for providing a safe refuge underground. While they didn't invite other wildlife into their homes, they did truly become accidental heroes. The book is written as a newscast, with koala and emu at the news desk. Field reporter Kangaroo introduces readers to Wombat and her new friends. An Accidental Hero, a Mostly True Wombat Story by Laura Rediger and Debbie Palin. A STEM picture book published by Ifrig Publishing, available at ifrigpublishing.com or wherever books are sold. For more about the author, go to lauraredigerbooks.com. Hi, I'm British author Keith Anthony Baird and I'm interrupting your broadcast <laughs> to let you know that my publisher, Bridgetscape Press, are releasing my latest book in May. Now, it's a dystopian cyberpunk novella called Synthetica. Um, loose premises, it's about an ex-marine who is now a bounty hunter in a futuristic Tokyo. So if that's something you might be interested in, the good news is, is that it's on pre-order all the way until May 21st. So if you are wanting a Kindle version, you can download it on pre-order for just 99 cents. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Welcome back, everybody. So, Rose, when you've been daydreaming lately, what have you been daydreaming about? Hmm. Well, I daydream a lot, obviously. Um... I often daydream about the kind of enchanted palace I would like to live in if I had to. I love it. My, my, on my first date with my fiance, I confessed to her that my dream at some point was to live in a castle. And that was kind of a risky, <laughs> you know, like she could have been like, this guy's clearly a weirdo. And she was like, oh my gosh, that would be a dream, you know, and she, her, you know, she would, she would want to be the person who is wandering up and down the, the tower, uh, you know, in, in a, in a, in a long, uh, dress, you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and I would be like the, the writer up in the tower hammering away, you know, at, at my next, uh, <laughs> at my next work. So what would your enchanted palace be like? Well, it's got beautiful, beautiful gardens, of course. And I can walk around as much as I like. This is sort of um this is sort of my I'm feeling too, I'm feeling tired and too busy kind of daydream. Mm -hmm. I daydream that I have as much time as I like. And um it's it's a beautiful palace, of course. And Food magically appears in the kitchen, so I don't have to worry about starving or anything. Yes, that would be nice. Yeah. And I think I think there's a swimming pool of some kind. <laughs> I get to go swimming a lot. That's another one of my hobbies. I like to swim. And um, it has beautiful views, ah, of, like the mountains and the sea. Yeah. It's like lots of white marble everywhere. It's very warm. Yeah, I mean that's one thing that I've, I, you know, if 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 I get to build my dream castle, mine will have insulation in the walls. Yes, because definitely. Because castles not warm, but I would love a warm castle. Yeah, <laughs> it would be great. Yes, it's very um, warm. And, and like what I would say, the front entrance way look like for yours? I've envisioned mine certainly too much, perhaps. Mm. Well, um, I kind of admire the Italian palazzo look. Mm. I think it would be like. You know, broad and airy with um, marble columns and a tiled floor. There'd be a fountain in the middle and a sweeping staircase. Can, ah, that's can, like, great. Yeah, go yeah. up grandly. Yeah, your your yeah. your castle is far more welcoming. Mine mine would have the you know the two towers at the front and the portcullis and the yeah. you know you got to have the murder hole. Uh, you Naturally, know, like, uh, my, my mine would be uh, mine would be a, a a little bit more grim. Uh, but I love the idea of I I actually love fountains i've i've made a fountain in my backyard uh oh. so i love the idea of having a fountain as a, a you know welcoming in uh you know in your in your palace entrance that is very cool yeah well in the in the daydream you know i'm there all alone and i have all the time in the world to do whatever i want in real life of course i get very bored and lonely quickly but this is yes. a this is a daydream for when i'm feeling when i'm feeling like things are too hectic Yes. And like when I want to go to sleep, you know, it's like, ah, back in my palace. 
Yes. And I'm just wandering my gardens and reading my books. And I have all the time in the world to read all the books I want. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am an extrovert. So I would, the idea of a castle is, you know, I would have to be having parties. I would have to be populating that yeah. castle. I could not live in a castle by myself. Uh, but uh, yeah. yes, I, 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 I do love that idea as well. That's, uh, you know, in, in the long-term plan. <laughs> yeah. How can I, how can I acquire a castle? Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, that's awesome. So, yeah. uh, what else have you, what, what's something you want listeners to be thinking about these days? What, what's been on your mind? Well, a serious issue that I actually care a lot about is plastic pollution in the oceans. That's um, my sort of my, that's my personal um, environmental cause. I'm always picking up plastic off the street and putting it in trash cans. I figure even if it ends up in a landfill, it's better than it going in the ocean. I feel like more people need to be aware of this. Yeah. And like, what got you, much... what got you interested in that initially? Well, when I was, you know, procrastinating and scrolling on my phone, I found a statistic saying that if we keep pouring plastic to the ocean, by 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish. Oh my and gosh. this was so disgusting yeah. and horrifying that, it, like, I made it my mission to start picking up plastic. Yeah. I live quite near um, the Sound, Puget Sound. So sometimes I go along the beach there and pick up, pick up trash and plastic and put it and throw it away. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Cause yeah. it is, I mean, and, and I don't think most people understand plastic does break down very, very slowly yeah. and it does so in a way that is toxic. So yes. uh, yeah, that, that is really important. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm one of those people who uh, back when we used to get cans of soda in six packs, I would, you know, be cutting so that the, <laughs> it wasn't, uh, you know, even in, in landfills, it was not uh, getting the, the, you know, turning into little uh, uh, monstrous bird torture devices. Uh, yeah. But, I do yeah, the same thing. It is, it is. It is something that we need to pay more attention to. And also just reducing the amount of plastic we use and create, like mm -hmm. on a larger scale. Um, I agree. Yeah, yes. yeah that that I, I, I hear you. So uh, one of the things that I sometimes do on the show, I'm not great about remembering to uh, to post about these, but when I remember, I post a weekly poll. So if you had a question for the world, what would be your poll question? Well, this is a question... I've asked my family, if you had to buy a sailboat or a horse, you know, two expensive things, extremely expensive to buy and extremely expensive to maintain, but you have to do it, which one would you choose? And I love that framing. It's not which would you want, it's if you had to, because you're right. These are both incredibly arduous, expensive, <laughs> time-consuming <laughs> things that I think a lot of people think, oh, it would be so great to have a horse or it would be so great to have a sailboat. And the, you know, the old joke is, uh, you know, the two happiest days for a boat owner are the day you get your boat and the day you sell your boat, <laughs> you know, and the same is yeah. probably true of your horse. Like it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love that one. That would be good. And you're right. That's a, that does reveal something about uh, people themselves, you know? So yeah. where would you fall? Not to put a, you know, an elbow on the scale, but when you're talking about that with your family, which way do you go? Um, the sailboat, I think, because I live in Seattle. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I could get a sailboat and I could like join the yachting club. It might even be sort of fun, at least for a while. Yeah. I could join, teach someone to just, I could pay someone to teach me how to sail, sail my boat. I could join the, the, the sailboat club. I could sail on the, on the water. I mean, I'm sure you're right. And the day, the happiest days would be when I, I got the sailboat and, the happy, and when I, I sold the sailboat, but it might, I might learn something, you know, and I might, oh, yeah. yeah, I might learn a lot and um, it might be fun. Yeah. yeah, I might I might meet people and yeah. Yeah, I think that could be. Friends. I mean, it could be really cool. You're right. There's the social aspect, and mm -hmm. I mean, from you're right from the learning aspect of. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of nautical just the vocabulary, yeah. <laughs> just learning. Oh, that's what that is. Uh, yeah, that would be really fascinating. See, I think I would go the horse way because mm -hmm. I am not particularly. You know, I I I, I enjoy infrequently being out on the open water but that wouldn't be something i would enjoy much but you know th there's the possibility with a horse of forming this kind of positive relationship yeah. you know the downside of course is you don't necessarily know the personality of the horse you will get <laughs> it yeah could, it could go poorly well, well if we're let's let's make it fair you don't have to like buy something off the internet you can 
you can meet your horse or your sailboat first or look at your sailboat first. Yes, that's true. You yes. In this, you can in do, this you can shop first. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I like that. Okay. Well, yes, yeah. I would love to have that horse where it's like, you know, the, the perfect kind of, you know, like the ones in the fantasy stories where the, yeah. you know, the, the character has the horse that always responds perfectly. And, you know, they have got this, uh, this deep connection. That would be very cool. But it would yeah. be a lot of work. I wouldn't buy a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody would have to make me buy a horse. Yeah. Someone have to make me buy a sailboat. But I think I would get a lot of enjoyment as well as aggravation out of it. Especially yeah. since, you know, like, like I say, I live I live on Puget Sound and I can sail around Puget Sound exploring the islands. That might be that might be fun if I if I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. It is beautiful out there. I, I was there a couple of years ago and uh, went out kayaking in the sound yeah. and didn't realize how hard the tidal pull would be mm. and i ended yeah. up a long way from the little house that we'd rented oh no uh, yeah and i could i mean i could not fight the tide and i was like oh okay yeah. i'm just gonna go out to sea apparently <laughs> yeah. it was uh, it was it was uh more difficult uh th than i expected uh but uh it is a beautiful place uh so yeah, yeah that, that's 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 that would be fun to explore uh you know under under the power of the sailboat rather than yeah by oars um yeah so what's something that's currently sitting in your uh, tbr pile that you're looking forward to reading um the good the bad and the aunties by jesse q sutanto oh, it's gonna wow. be published it's called the good the bad and the aunties it is going to be published at the end of the month it is the third book in a series i just adore um it is his the series is hysterically funny it starts with dial a for aunties and it starts with the protagonist accidentally murdering her blind date. That's how it starts. And things go down a very zany hill from there. <laughs> and like, it's some, it's, this, these are some of the funniest books I have ever read. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. Where, what are they? Are, is it a, a, a contemporary setting? What's the, where, where are these? Oh, it's a contemporary setting. It's all about um, the um, Asian, like Asian immigrant experience in America. At least the first book is. You know, um, the protagonist and her aunties, she has four of them. Well, she has three aunties and a mom. All of them very, very loving, but very pushy. And um, she's 26 and they're still, or they're still bossing her around. And, um, and uh, they're all um, Chinese, Chinese Indonesian. And the, the immigrants who've moved to America started a wedding catering visit, business. Uh, and what so, city is it? Is it set in a city? You know, uh, Seattle or San Francisco or? Um, it's set in California somewhere. Um, I'm not. I. She's not totally clear which, or maybe I just forgot. Yeah. But Southern California. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that that really does sound fun. Uh, yeah, it is very fun. And the second book is set. She is is during her wedding when they go to Oxford for that. And you know, the author made a point saying that you know she there's lots of Asian Im immigrant experiences around the world and it's different everywhere. So you can't just say the Asian immigrant experience and have that right. cover everything because it's all different in all different parts of the world. Like her, the man she's marrying, her groom, he was an Asian immigrant to England, but his family is much wealthier than hers and they had a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read the, the recently uh, R.F. Kuang's uh, Babel, which is about a bunch of different immigrant uh students coming to oxford and yeah. their experience but with a magical twist uh it's a fantastic <laughs> book and i just heard that it's been optioned so it's going to be people, oh, wow. people will be able to see the i'm not sure if it will be a film or if it will be a, a series but uh yeah highly highly recommend uh so what's that one what's that second one called the the oxford one um it is called uh i know i'm putting you on the spot now so it was a is for aunties was the first Dial A for aunties. Dial A for aunties. Okay. Um, four aunties in a wedding. And then the, the, the third book coming out at the end of this, this month is The Good, The Bad, and The Aunties. And it's Jesse Q. Jesse Q. Sue Tonto. Okay, excellent. Well, yeah. I will, I will, uh, and I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. So if folks are interested, because yeah. that right away, I'm going to add that to my, uh, my, my TBR list on Goodreads. Yeah, like uh, I say, they're hysterically funny. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I, uh, I, I, I've, I've added this new kind of question that I'm uh, asking authors to kind of get to know folks. I, I, I am cognizant of the fact that in our 
current political environment, people are, and, and social media environment, people are saying things which in some cases I suspect they don't even believe, but they say the most outrageous thing they possibly can for attention. And so to kind yeah. of spoof that, what would be your you know, most controversial take that, uh, that, that, you know, somebody could clip out of this show and, and, you know, cause a bunch of Sturm and Drang. So what's your big, uh, hot rage, you know, outrageous take for the outrage machine? Little free libraries need better books. You see a little free library ahead and you're all excited. Yay. Free books. But no, no, it's all full of rubbish. No. <laughs> Popular we need to do something about this. Library with good books. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So somebody out there is going to be deeply offended, and that's yes. Perfect. I want free library with good books. <laughs> Put good books in your little free library. Totally agree. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, where can folks, Rose? Where can folks find your work and find out more about you online? Um. All right. I'll be honest here. I am not very good at social media. Um. One reason. Why I'm very glad to do this interview is because it's not about me trying to maintain my post, my social media post, but actually talking to a real human being, yes, which I really yes. appreciate. <laughs> um, but um, you can find me on Goodreads. Like I say, not good at maintaining it. I'm sorry. Um, Facebook, same thing. I have a, an Amazon authors page where I list the anthologies as they come out when I can. Yeah. It's... um. My author's page doesn't show every anthology I'm published in because Amazon only lets you list the things, list the anthologies where you're actually listed by name as an author. Yes. And editors can't include every single darn author. So. Yes. For folks yes, who does... don't know that, I, you know, I, I, having published a few anthologies, you get to choose, I think, three. And mm -hmm. so I'll have these, you know, fantastic authors, uh, you know, that I, I, I want to I promote everyone. And I've got to pick the three kind of biggest names. <laughs> so that is frustrating yeah. for new folks who are going, I'm in this anthology too. Yes. And unfortunately, I can't link to that. So yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But, but uh, you know, Goodreads is a great mechanism. And so if folks are not using Goodreads, uh, it is a good way to find out about authors. And so you go there and you find Rose's page and then you like, and then Goodreads will let you know, hey, something else is, Rose has got something else coming out. So I, I encourage all of our viewers to uh, to go and, and connect that way. That's a good one. Yeah. So do you have a recommendation for somebody else I should have on this show? Who else should I reach out to and get on here? Well, I have a coworker named Dutch Jackson who has self-published a novel recently. Uh, excellent. He, yeah. Well, a and, novel, novel titled "Weapon of God." Weapon and, of God. Yeah, and he, he is a wonderful person, and it's a good novel. It's the first in an exciting series, and he'd have plenty to say. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I will. Uh, I will absolutely reach out and get him on the show. That will be cool. Yeah. Well, uh, so there's some people I have to thank before we get to our final advice for our for our listeners. Uh, thanks to the artist Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro song, I Prefer the Dusk. Let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland with three Ds. And thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. If you're in a band and you'd like your song used on the show, I'd love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song, so email me. And thanks to Doug, the producer, as always, for making this show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. And I cannot forget to mention, Writers Not Writing is a production of Not A Pipe Publishing. So please go to notapipepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. <laughs> this show, rate it and review it wherever you found it. And please check out Rose's uh, series with the post-apocalyptic mermaids uh, that is titled The Drowned World Series. And you find that on Amazon. So mm -hmm. grab your copy of that. And when you do, go and click on that fifth star and give a little review. It doesn't have to be long and it would make Rose's day. So please it would. Do yeah. so. That will be really helpful. And for this show too, <laughs> click on that like button. It's, it really makes a difference. Tell a friend about it. Um, so Rose and I are, you know, folks, you're going into your week. Rose, what's your advice for everybody as they enter into their week this next week? May, may procrastination be with you. I love it. I mean, we're going into, you know, it's April. We're going into May. May procrastination be with you. Very nice. Uh, exactly. And I always tell everybody, you know, our, our uh, lives need spaces just like books need spaces. And so uh, make sure you make space for yourself. And lastly, uh, no matter how much you procrastinate, Rose and I are still proud of you. Yes. 